welcome to worship. Please stand as we have our call to worship on the screen. Today's call to worship was written by Carol Hennon. And Jesus said, Come to all mothers and all children. He said, Come. To all who long to be mothered, he said, Come. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Well, good morning, one and all. Thank you for being here today. Whether you're here or worshiping online or in person, we always want to say a warm welcome and thank you to all of you. Uh, today uh, is a special day, so we'll be talking a little bit more about that in the service. It can also be a complicated day, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. But this is your first time with us here in person. We love if you would, in the pew before you, fill out the connection card so we get to know you, drop that information in the box. And then downstairs, you can have some time or a coffee and donuts after the service. So this morning, we're going to get started with singing God So Love. The words will be on the screen. Sing along with us as we sing God So Love.
You want your perfect love to be at the foundation of our city, and we pray that we spread your love. Let our doors be open and our hearts be welcoming to all kids and their families. Let their goodness shine through us. Amen. with uh, choosing the uh, 
next year and was able to show them that it would be the Second thing, my cousin Bob, who had a stem cell transplant, if I can't chemo right before, uh, he, as of Monday, Monday, he still felt like he was at death's door, but by Wednesday, his body finally started working again, and they got to go home late Wednesday afternoon, so it was great. So again, Sharon's uh, her phrases this morning. One is for Audrey, who uh, has had a busy week with award ceremony and graduation, and also helping select the cheerleaders for next year. Um, also, her cousin Bob, who had stem cell uh, replacement um, and chemo, uh, was feeling awful on Monday, but by Wednesday, uh, through God's grace, is feeling good enough to go home. So that's a that's a blessing. What else? Penny. Okay. So, two, two praises from Penny. Uh, one, Gus, who helped all, all the transplanting of all the flowers out here after they were purchased, uh, and also transporting up, helping to transport them up here. So, great job, Gus. And also, just a uh, praise for her dad. Uh, we prayed for him last week. He was having what was going to be an update to his pacemaker, but the procedure was uh, they had to call an audible, and they replaced the whole thing. It took longer than expected. Um, but everything went well. They even got his garden planted while they were there. So praises all around uh, for Penny and her dad and for Gus. This is a praise. On Friday, <clears throat> the Lindbergh graduates had cap and gown on, and they did a walk and bus ride so they could visit their elementary schools, their middle school, and then back to the high school. So it was kind of fun for me because I caught up <clears throat> with our grandson at Spearing Middle School, the very school that I had retired from. <laughs> and it was just so awesome. The cap and gown kids walked in the halls, the cheerleaders were lined up, you know, with the little palms that, you know, they got to see teachers from yesteryear. And it was just a big thrill. So I uh, think that's a wonderful praise to see all those young people in uh, such fine form. Well, what a blessing. So, um, so Dan, Diane was just sharing is that in the Lindbergh School District, they had a special event. They do this every year or just this Apparently, year? this is something new, but okay. it seems to be a tradition, a tradition now. now. So a new tradition that started recently where the graduates will go back to the elementary school, the middle school, and the high school to kind of walk through those halls, just visit some of those teachers, and uh, to kind of relive some of those memories from the past. Um, and so that's great that they do that, and in the midst of that, Diane was able to catch up with her grandson um, and get a picture. <laughs> so that's great. What a blessing. Well, uh, yeah. Gary just recently had his 50th grade school reunion nearby here in Nottingham, grade school, and on the corner of that, because we were at the grade school, and then got together for a whole weekend um, as kids meet. Wow. So Gary had his 50th grade school uh, that's, a, that's a while, and you did graduate grade school, so that's good. good <laughs> yeah, so. I did an extra year, but I got through. <laughs> extra year, just got through. And, and so that was at Nottingham Grade School, and so what a blessing to go back and see uh, friends that you uh, attended with and to celebrate 50 years at Nottingham Elementary. So was that Nottingham School by the park? Yeah. Okay. Some of them have gone all the way through eight years together. Well, that's great. Some of us nine. And so... <laughs> 
What else? I think we need to keep Gary in our prayers. He's not doing fabulous. He's having some, yeah. still having problems. Yeah. Continue to keep Gary Gilbert in, in your prayers. Yeah. His, his hip and back. He's, he's going to have a procedure done later this month. Uh, but we need to get into that procedure and get Diane to that procedure <laughs> as well. And so just be in prayers uh, for uh, Gary and Diane uh, for relief from pain.
dwell in my soul. So, so the five in your hymnals or the words will be on the screen. Just the third, first and fourth stanza, it is well with my soul. Near and around Ephesus, 
that uh, John the Beloved is writing. And last week, if you were with us, uh, in John chapter 2, verses uh, 3 through 6, what he really talked about was about this love that we have for God and how it's transformative. And that as we love God, we have the ability uh, to love him anew and to love others. And so as we consume more of God, that is transformative. And so this week, this week he's taking a different uh, tact. And again, as John is talking to these church members about these cessationists that are trying to divide uh, the churches that are trying to divide on belief and theology, um, what is happening within these churches, scholars believe, is that there is hate or resentment or bias against each other. And so he is warning against hating your brother or sister in Christ. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. I, I tend not to uh, title my messages. I don't know why. Uh, in seminary, they taught us we need to have a title, uh, a, a point that we're trying to make, and then three points to support that point, and so on. And as you can tell, sometimes I don't always do that. But on today, if I was going to give a name to this one, it would be a question. And the question is, are you blinded by hate? Are you blinded by hate? And so, and because it's that time of year, it's time for spring cleaning. And, you know, so this is the time of year where you move out the bed and you get all those dust bunnies under the bed out. Um, and those nooks and crannies you don't worry about until this time of year. This morning we're going to do the same thing with our heart. We're going to do a little bit of deep examination and cleaning out of our heart this morning. So if you would, please follow along. Uh, it'll be on your screens or if you have it with you. Uh, this is 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11 this week says this, Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and true light is already shining. Whoever says that he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. This is the word of the Lord in our hearing this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful for your love, for your grace. Father, that even though we were your enemies, even though we hated you, you still sought us out. You still, still atoned for us. You still saved us and rescued us. And so, Father, I pray that as we take time this morning to consider your word, to consider your love for us, Father, consider how we can love those around us. Father, I pray that you would help us to do self-examination today and later this week. <coughs> Father, that we would see where our heart is, who we have animosity towards. Father, how we can give forgiveness, how we can have reconciliation, because that is the ministry you call us to, is a ministry of reconciliation. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to do some spring cleaning today and this week, and I pray that you would do a mighty work in each one of us, whether we're here in person or at home. So I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So this week, one of my favorite things to do is to go to bookstores and to buy books. I know I'm a nerd. And so I found this book, Quality of Life by James Mishner. Has anyone read it randomly? No? Okay. I'll let you know how it goes. Uh, but James Mishner is a author uh, who's written several books. He's a historian, a historian and typically he writes uh, fiction, historical fiction. And so, actually, one of his books I read in the seminary uh, that was called Hawaii, that was about uh, missionaries. There, I'm talking about right here. This is for you, Beth. But it was about missionaries who left the Northeast uh, in the 1700s to go to uh, Hawaii to uh, be missionaries to Hawaii. But in the midst of that, um, what missionaries did back in those days is they would take one culture 
and transport it to another culture and somewhat obliterate that culture. So what this pastor would do is he had his nice wool suit that he had while he was preaching up in Boston or wherever in the cold of north, the Northeast. And he transported that to Hawaii and, and, and preached in that way. Those are some of the examples that he has given. But in this book, I thought it was fascinating in the cover because it says this, James Mishner writes about the problem of our cities, about race, about education, youth, drugs, and crime. He comments on television and the role of the free press and the population crisis and conservation at a time when the angry on all sides of these issues are shouting more and more and listening less. Mr. Mishner makes a reasoned plea for balance and for enlightened response to our problems. An eloquent statement of his own faith in our American traditions, he relates our solutions of our problems to enduring strength, stability, and flexibility of our basic institutions and values. Sounds familiar. What year do you think this book was written in? What is it, Jan? 2000? Nope. 70s. 70s. We got 70s close. 1970 was when this was written. Over 50 years ago. Does it sound familiar? When the shouting on all sides is more and more and listening less and less. This, this idea of hatred, this idea of animosity isn't something new. It seems like it. It seems like it's being ratcheted up. But obviously, this is, hatred is a thing that we have seen since the beginning. Since the opening pages of uh, Genesis, where we see brothers killing brothers out of jealousy, out of animosity, and out of hatred, right? And so this idea of hatred, of animosity, runs throughout our history as human beings. And so today, it's good to take pause and just to take some self-evaluation of, is there any hate in my heart? Which is a good question to ask. Because I have to say, I typically, that's why I know I start the morning by doing self-examination saying, okay, who do I hate today? Who is on my get list today? And so for this morning, this week, I'm going to encourage us to, to look at that a little bit. And just to remind us of what's going on here at these churches, you know, again, <laughs> sometimes we can forget about the context we're in, but remember, this is early Christianity. This is not only early Christianity, but it's also not in Jerusalem, but it's in Ephesus. So there's already a plethora of problems that these churches are facing as they are having issues as they're accommodating Jewish people and new Jews into Christianity, right? And there's also these that are uh, were in modern-day Ephesus that had a plethora of different uh, religions. Uh, it was a pluralistic society and had a lot of different religions that they were worshiping. So you had people converting from other traditions, right? And so here in this church already that they had issues of race, Jewish and Gentile, right? We had issues of uh, religious differences and politics are all happening all in these churches. It sounds familiar, right? It, it's nothing new. But here, these are already on top of the added to a brand new church. And so here you can understand why John is writing his, what is he, how does he begin this passage? My beloved. Or as he refers to his dear children, because he loves them. He sees the strife. He sees what's happening with his people that he cares about deeply. And he's wanting to bring unity in back to the church, to, to, to bring a, a well back into the church, to help bring these two parties back together, to bring love. And so part of what John says, and it sounds very similar to what Jesus says, it's not a new command that I bring to you, right? It's a, uh, this is an old command. And so it's good to come back to hear what has the Old Testament said about hating our siblings, our siblings here, our spiritual siblings, but also just hate in general. So in Leviticus 9, 19, 17, which I feel like this first John has been in a, you know, tandem with Leviticus. I feel like I brought Leviticus more up in the past few weeks than ever before. But in Leviticus 19, 17, it says this, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you, you incur sin because of him. Now this isn't Jesus talking. This isn't new. This is old. This is going back to Leviticus, right? And I want to take a moment and just point out here because it is important to note that as we talk through here, even in the passage, 
uh, that we're reading from today, who is he addressing here? Who are we not to hate in this passage? The word is brother, right? Meaning we have his familial ties. So here he is talking to uh, the people of this church. He's talking about how we have all been baptized together. We are all now brothers and sisters and don't hate anyone within the church, which is true. But I also want us to, to not forget Jesus' ad uh, admonition about loving your enemies. So it's one of these things that this morning, although that we're going to be talking about in the context of brotherhood, because that's what John is specifically talking about in this passage, I don't want us to forget about loving our enemies because we're not off the hook there. But here, this isn't an old command. That's why he's saying this isn't, this isn't something I'm new. This isn't something that I'm just saying, oh, guys, by the way, I'm trying to bring everybody together. I have an agenda. I want everybody to be together. Be together. No, he's saying this is something that, that Moses, Moses will do about. <laughs> and so the, the idea here, the Hebrew word is siane, which is, which is generally, it's hard to translate. We were talking about love and last week and how the English language doesn't have a good word to really transcend all forms of love, just like Eskimos don't have a one word to translate all snow, right? Well, it's hard to translate hate because we see it in different ways throughout even the Old Testament. So here we see, do not hate your brother, which we typically translate as a passionate anger, uh, fury. Because whenever I think of someone hating, I hear, I see a fist held up in the air and just shaking my fist at someone because I can't stand to be in their presence, right? But it's not always in that way. <laughs> so in Genesis uh, 29, 31, we see this passage, this verse, where it says, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And I have to say, Rachel and Leah, this story is one of my favorite stories. It's a beautiful story. Um, it's really a story about how love, uh, how God has uh, empathy, how he has compassion on individuals. And here, Leah, if we remember the story, uh, uh, she was uh, one of two sisters. She was not very attractive. Unfortunately, and so the, as the story goes, as Jacob went to uh, buy for her hand, um, Leah's father-in-law did a, a switcheroo, I guess, and on the wedding day, which you would think that's not going to happen this week uh, for Jackson and Lily, the kind of switcheroos that are happening. But here, the father switched the brides because Leah was the oldest bride, and no one wanted to marry her. That's yeah, very sad. Very sad story, right? And so here, what happened after, after Jacob realized what was happening, the next day, whoopsie, I don't know how all this happens, but here we go. Then he said, no, I love Rachel, I want to marry Rachel. And so their dad said, okay, work another seven years, and you can have her too. And so this idea of Leo is being hated by Rachel, and there became this competition of who could have kids using uh, their maid servants. It's, you know, this is a, a modern day, we're talking about movies from the Bible, this would be up there, wow, this is a lot going on. And so ultimately, God saw Leah, that she was hated, that she was uh, despised. The problem with Leah was that she wanted to get her identity from being a mom, of providing a heir, right? And that's how she wanted to be identified. And it didn't matter how many kids that she had, it wasn't enough. And there's a beautiful passage here where, where it shows that her love, uh, that Leah wasn't going for Jacob's love anymore, but she was satisfied with God's love, which is a beautiful picture. But here we see that the way that, the, the, that Moses talked about this, the way that she was treated, was hate. Now this wasn't passionate hate, right? This wasn't a murder, but it was an animosity, right? We've experienced that. Somewhat within siblings, maybe not to this extent, but there's some sibling rivalry, there's sibling uh, frustration that we've experienced. There is where we look at others around us, maybe it's co-workers that we just are annoyed with all the time, that are always not doing things the right way, that are always getting the heads up. But there is something, just like Leah has experienced, bullying, frustration, like animosity, that then is being translated here as hatred. We also see in Exodus 1.10, Come, let us deal truly with them, lest they multiply, war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Now, of course, this is Pharaoh talking to his people about the Israelites, and they're scared that they're going to rise up and join their enemies because 
because they're numbers. And here this word for enemies is the same word for hate or siyane. And we also have this interesting, curious uh, passage that we see in Malachi. I'm bringing back all the golden oldies uh, from all these Leviticus and Malachi, just for moms today. This is Malachi 1, 2 and 3. It says, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet I love Jacob, but Esau I have hated, and I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to the jackals of the desert. Now, if you go back and look at Esau and uh, Jacob's story, there's a lot going on in it. But Esau wasn't the brightest bulb in the batch. He ends up giving out his uh, birthright for a bowl of soup and so forth. But here, he doesn't do anything specifically uh, bad against God. He doesn't do anything that he hates God. Um, here, this is just relating that, that basically that God had favor on Jacob, and he didn't have favor on Esau. But it's translated here as he did. Right? So why do I go through all these passages? One to establish, and whenever I did a, a simple search, whenever I put in my, uh, my Bible, online Bible concordance, and typed in hate, just hate, not hated, not any of the other variants, hate came up 87 times throughout the Bible. And that's usually the KJV, so I don't know exactly how, how many times if I put in hated or any of those. But it's in the Bible a lot. So again, this is why John is saying this isn't an old command or a new command. It's been around for a while, and it's been well established. But I also want us to understand that it's not this just passionate hatred that I want to annihilate everyone around me. That it is a bias in my heart, an animosity. It is a prejudice that I have that maybe I'm not even aware that I have against a certain person or group. And we see it in the New Testament, too. Of course, we see Jesus talking about um, not hating our enemies by loving our, our neighbor and so forth. But we also see this passage that I just read uh, brought back up in Romans 9, 10 through 13, where it says, And not only so, but also when Rachel or Rebecca had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, they had nothing, they had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue. Not because of works, but because of him who called. She was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. So we see that this isn't just an Old Testament idea. This is throughout the New Testament. It's reaffirmed in the New Testament. And I also want to bring this up because sometimes we feel like we have two different gods. We have the God of the Old Testament, who's all about vengeance and hatred and anger and brimstone and fire. And then we get this new God that we get in Matthew, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who was born and who's a little bit more easygoing, that loves everybody and just, you know, gives grace. But no, here what John is saying, what we're saying, is it's the same God. He has mercy, he has patience, but hate is around us all the time. So if we turn on the news, what do we get? Hate. It is one of the biggest sellers. They always say it's sex sells. Well, he is right up there with it. And so what happens, whenever we consume that all the time, what do we start doing? We start hating. We start having animosity. We start questioning everything and anyone around us. So that's why it's good to look at our hearts. So just like as John says in his passage, is that sometimes whoever hates his brother in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going, it's because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Sometimes we are blinded. So we've kind of established it from the Bible, and so it's good to kind of come back up to 2024 and what is what is the current definition of hate. And so sometimes I just you know say, well, what does the internet say? What would it say? And sometimes I get it from Mary Webster or whoever. But this one was an interesting one. This is a legal definition. This is from the Office of the Attorney General for the District of Columbia. And it has on there, what is hate? And it says this, hate generally starts with a bias that is left unchecked. Bias is a preference either for or against an individual or group that affects someone's ability to judge fairly. 
when that bias is left unchecked, it becomes normalized or accepted and may even escalate into violence. When hate manifests against a person or group of people, it usually derives from ignorance, anger, anger, fear, a sense of injury, or a perceived threat to the status quo. When the word hate is used in law, such as hate crime law, it does not mean rage, anger, or general dislike. In this context, hate means, means bias against people or groups, of, groups with specific characteristics. And I thought that was helpful, enlightening. Because typically, whenever I think of hate, I equate it with rage. But it doesn't necessarily mean that. And so, and oftentimes, whenever I'm preparing for sermons, I really feel like this is time with God and I, where God's saying, hey, Jeff, how are you doing with all this? So I have to ask the question, take a moment, turn, shut my computer, and say, who do I hate? Who do I have bias against? What people am I skeptical of? And that's a good question to ask. Because I don't like asking those questions. They're uncomfortable, they're messy. And so, so the question is, who do we have bias against? And sometimes we may have a reason to have bias against people. Maybe we've had bad experience with particular types of people in the past. And so we want to bring that up and apply that to anybody that looks like that individual. So it could have been that you were in a, a bad relationship previously, maybe it's abusive, so you're very skeptical on any, any person like that person. It could have been that you did a business deal that went sour, so you're not, like, I'm not dealing with anybody like that. It could be somebody that is a different, different uh, like we said earlier when we were talking about the Church of Ephesus, it could be a person of a different race, it could be a, a person of a different political bent, it could be a person of a different uh, religion that I have a bias against, that I am not loving, that I'm not caring for. And a lot of this for me, as I'm doing this introspection with God, as we're doing business this week, it's because of ignorance. One of the things that I found fascinating, I was, you know, as I've been praying for the Middle East and all this conflict that's over there, I heard that, that uh, in Gaza there was a church that was demolished by a bomb. And typically whenever I think of Gaza or Palestine, what I don't think about is Christian brothers and sisters that are having church services there. So it was a little bit of a wake-up call for me to say, yeah, there's brothers and sisters in, in this area that's also receiving uh, some of the, the, the hatred between these two peoples. And how can I pray and how can I love my brothers and sisters there? But again, one of those ways that I'm walking in blindness, walking in ignorance, and then I'm asking God, how can I love those around me even better? And as Christians, looking at ourselves and how we love those around us is important. Oftentimes, I, I chat with young, young folks, not always, but sometimes. And there is a phrase that is used often now, especially with, with younger folks, that says this, there is no love like Christian hate. No love like Christian hate. Because oftentimes when people, especially if they don't look like uh, those in Christian churches or, or believe the same thing in Christian churches, they don't receive kindness, they don't receive compassion, they don't receive empathy. They receive judgment. They receive rejection. And so a lot of younger people, as I talk to them about, hey, would you be interested in coming to church? They quickly say, no, I'm not interested in that. And why? And sometimes it is because they have been by a previous church or another church or a family member has treated them, and they would say, unfairly. And that they didn't receive love or compassion or empathy, but judgment and rejection. And so for us as Christians, how are we showing love, compassion, empathy, 
patience, just as God has shown, shown us. We have to ask each other, is there any animosity between any of us here that maybe has been over the years that we like to paint over instead of, you know, clean up? Whenever I'm redoing and painting, I always want to do it quick and get it over with and all that. Amber says, no, there's a process to this. You do it the right way, one time rather than multiple times later on, right? But sometimes there may be animosity between those that are here. It has animosity and hatred towards one another that maybe has been building in conflict over the years. God, where's that hate? Where's that animosity? What do I need to do? Who do I need to forgive? How do I deal with that? Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this, and Christian fellowship lives and exists by the intercession of its members for one another, or it collapses. I can no longer condemn or hate a brother for whom I pray, no matter how much trouble he causes me, his face that hitherto may have been strange and intolerable to me is transformed in intercession into the countenance of a brother for whom Christ died in the face of a forgiven sinner. Are you praying for those that you hate? Are you praying for your enemies? Those that have done you wrong? Because if you legitimately go to God and say, I am praying for good to happen to this person, that they meet you, that they change their life, that they have blessings come as a result of knowing you, God, it's hard to hate them. Why do we do this? Why do we want to love our enemies? Why do we try to stamp out the hate? Because it's good for our hearts and because we were once enemies to God. Romans 5, 6 through 11 says this. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God, love that, but God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Sometimes sinners is, is translated enemies. While we were still enemies, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, talked about that a couple weeks ago, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were still, excuse me, for while we were enemies, Hatred. We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more now than we were, we are reconciled. Shall we be saved by His life? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. We are able to love. We are able to forgive. We are able to not judge people prematurely. Why? Because God did that for me. For you. So because we've experienced that grace, we can give that same grace to others. To get to know their stories, to hear what their struggles are, to pray for them, to see how we can help them, how to bless them. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, said this in one of his messages about loving your enemies. Returning hate for hate multiplies hate. My mom used to say, two wrongs don't make a right. Add a deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And that is what John is talking about. God is the God of light. In him there is no darkness. And he is calling us to do this. I'm going to finish with this. There's a famous a famous uh, prayer that's often attributed to St. Assisi, but I'll put this up a couple different ways. It wasn't prayed by St. Frank, uh, Francis Assisi. It was just something that was attributed to him. But it's talking about, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. And so I'm going to pray that for us as we close. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. 
where there is injury, pardon, where there is doubt, faith, where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is giving that we receive, and it is pardoning that we are pardoned. Friends, my encouragement and my challenge for you is to do some spring cleaning this week. Who do you have animosity towards? What bias do you have? Who would be on that hate list? And how can you give forgiveness? How can you let fear go? How can you become more informed? How can you know people personally and pray for them specifically? Let me pray for us, and then we'll transition. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this prayer. We thank you for your love for us. Father, we're thankful that even though that we were enemies, that we were sinners, Father, you still sent your son Jesus to die for us. Not because you had to, not because it was an obligation, but because you loved us. So, Father, I pray, I pray that you would be, be with each of us today, later this week, as we do some self-reflection and we question, who is it that I have bias against? Who is it that I often shake my fist at? Father, I pray that instead of shaking our fists, Father, I pray that you would help us to pray for those individuals. Father, I pray that in those prayers, we would ask people to seek to know you more personally. Father, that you would help us to love and have patience and perseverance and kindness and compassion and empathy. Father, I pray that you would help us to draw people to you, not away from you. Father, that you would help us to, to not be known for hate, but for love, for compassion, for empathy. Father, I pray that you would continue to work in each of our lives so that we can love and serve others. Father, that we can draw people here to worship together with you, to be part of our family. Father, that they would come to know you as their, their, their personal Savior, that their personal friend, their personal God. And I pray, Father, that we do this not only here, but also around the world. Father, there is so much hate that we see every day in the news. And so, Father, I pray that you would just do a mighty work not only here in St. Louis, not here um, in South City and South County, but also around the world. And so, Father, I pray that you would guide us to be your life wherever we go. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And as all those who are able to stand, if we stand, we're going to see we fall down. We're just going to see the verse before us one time. We fall down.
equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, who be glory forever and ever.